I'm going to try and make this light-hearted because it's a summer evening and inequality can be an absolutely depressing subject. So don't think I'm being deliberately flippant. It's just that I don't want to get you down and I do think there is a good news story at the end of this. I'm going to talk about the extent of inequality. I'm going to talk about the effects of it, what it does to us, very briefly. It's all going to be in 40 minutes. Uh, I'm going to talk about how it could come to an end, at least the extreme inequality we currently have. But first, I'm going to give you some evidence and some of the history of inequality in Britain. I'm going to concentrate on money and one particular kind of money, which is income. Because it's income, how much you receive every year, every month, every week, which tells us how much we're respected. If somebody doesn't respect you, they give you very little. If they think you're great, they give you a lot. Income is incredibly important. This first graph is showing the share, the take of the top 1% in six countries. Uh, the countries are the USA, the UK, Germany, France, Sweden, and the Netherlands. Way back 100 years ago, the top 1% everywhere took about a quarter of all income. Just think about this city. Think about the big houses around here, um, around the square in Bethnal Green, and who was living there. And it was people with servants, and they had a quarter of all the income of the country every year. That's why they could afford servants. But it was the same in all these affluent countries. And it peaked around about 1913, 1914. And then it began to fall. And it, fall, it fell for many, many reasons. The First World War required money. The poor had no money. So the rich were taxed during the war to pay for the war. But there was also activists. There was also a revolution in Russia. And that scared the people in the big houses who thought they might have to be a little bit nicer, just a little bit, not much, but just a little bit nicer because they didn't want to be put against the wall and shot. But there were trade unions as well that got together. And then there was a crash in 1929, and people with shares lost money. But the only people who had shares were rich. And then we have another war, and you have to tax people again to pay for the other war, and the people you tax are the rich and so on. And you watch them all cascading down and down and down and down, until the 1% in somewhere like the UK at the time I was a child were only taking 6% of all income. Actually 4% after tax. Now the maths of this is incredibly easy. When the 1% takes 6% of all income, the best of 1%, the highest paid people, when they take 6% of all income, they're being paid six times the average. Average earnings around about 25,000, six times the average, 150,000. That was as good as it ever got. That was the 1970s. The 1970s were brilliant. I was there. There were a few other people in the room there. Most of you were not there. But anyway, they've been maligned. People have said terrible things against the 70s. They were not perfect. Uh, but we were never as equal as we were then. UK, by the way, was the second most equitable large country in Europe. Only Sweden was more equal in the 1970s than the UK. Sheffield, where I've lived for quite a long time, I now live back in Oxford, I grew up. In Sheffield, life expectancy in the 70s was above the national average. It was doing better than the national average. That kind of north-south divide had almost disappeared in the 1970s. In fact, there were a few years in the 1970s when the population centre of the country began moving north, which it hardly ever did. And you can't imagine that now. Can you imagine people moving north on average, not south to London? Can you imagine house prices equalising? Can you imagine you not being paid more in different parts of the country? Can you imagine bankers getting less than doctors because doctors are seen as more valuable than bankers? I know it sounds ridiculous now, I know we live in a time now where you know that bankers are superhuman and we really need them and they're really valuable and we've got to pay them a million pounds because they're so special and doctors are just trash. But there was a time when I was young when doctors were paid more than bankers but nobody was paid that more than the average. 
and where the benefits you got if you were unemployed, you could live off because they were nearer to average earnings than they are now. It wasn't JSA anymore. It wasn't perfect. Racism was bad, but I've got to zoom on. Now, the plummeting. Notice the plummeting. We're first going to look at 1913. I won't go back to this. Then we're going to look at 1929. Then we're going to look at 1936. 1913, the Harrow Cricket, Harrow Eaton Cricket Match. Have any of you been to the Harrow? You have Harrow Eaton Cricket Match. We've got one nod at the back. Great. Okay, you don't need this explained to you, but the others do. Uh, not a great picture for focusing, but the ones with the hats and the canes went to Harrow. That's how you spot a, a Rovian. Winston Churchill went to Harrow. And those boys are holding their canes up and they're shouting. And their mums with big hats with bits of bird in are looking smug. And their dads are looking truly, truly happy because they're on top of the universe. This is July 1913 when this particular picture was taken. When these families had more than they'd ever had in the history of the planet. And they were on top. And they had no idea what was about to happen that a war was about to break out that wouldn't end for years and their kind of life wouldn't come round again. That's 1913. Here's the take of the 10%. High goes down to a minimum and zooms up. We'll get to the 1970s, 80s, and 90s a bit later. But that's the basic U-shaped cur curve you need to know occurred. In the UK, in the USA, didn't occur everywhere, not so steeply. 1929, this is a modern version of the famous 1929 picture where everybody's stepping down. In the original, they're all men and they all have different hats and the hats tell you their social class. The trilby, a bowler hat, a flap cap for the working class man. And the comment at the bottom was that the working class man is going to step into water and drown because in 1929, you're all supposed to have austerity and step down together. People were beginning to get angrier. But let's go forward to 1936, 37. This is one of the most famous social class photographs ever taken in the world. And again, taken at the Harrow Eaton annual cricket match. And again, a couple of Harrovians. They're the two taller boys looking nervous. And they're looking nervous because the world has changed by then. And the three working class boys who are being paid to take cushions so they could sit on while watching the cricket are looking cocky and sarky and arrogant and confident because things were changing. That's why the picture became so famous. It's appeared on the front of more books than I've ever seen a picture appear before because it was a picture of changing times. The sad story about that picture is that those two boys died quite young. One died of a fever, I think, within six months of the photograph being taken. These are the posh boys. And the other one ended up in a mental asylum. The three working class lads, as far as I know, are still actually alive. 1936. Modern day. Way up, way up to now. And because we've got no time, essentially, that was the plummeting. That was becoming more equal. And it carried on in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. So you get to the heady days of the 1970s, where, for a short time, most people can go to the same schools and nobody knows what a good or a bad school is. That kind of thing went on in the 1970s. And then, around about 1974, things began to change. In 1974, people in the south and east of the country voted conservative in large numbers. They didn't like the miners in the north. Uh, they didn't win the election, but it was a big swing. The Conservative Party uh, anoints Margaret Thatcher. They did it in a strange way back then. She becomes leader in 75, she wins an election in 79, doesn't lose an election in 83, doesn't lose an election in 87, John Major doesn't lose an election in 92, all the time inequality is rising, 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 rising. Labour finally gets in in 1997, but they've moved so far to the right that on some of these graphs you can't see the effect of that election victory, and inequality actually carries on rising because they didn't realise what they had to do to stop it all the way up to the crash of 2008. What you're seeing here is the crash of 2008. That's the spike. This is public spending as a proportion of GDP in 12 countries. The data comes from the IMF. The reason for showing it you is that at the top we've got Finland, 
where they spend 57% of their GDP on public services. So this should be a basket case. This is a kind of socialist nightmare state, right? They're taxing away innovation, taxing away entrepreneurship, never invent anything like new technology. That's the kind of way the story goes. But anyway, Finland 57%, which means they've got the best schools in the world, which means they've got a decent health service. Things aren't bad in Finland. But you might think Finland's a bit odd. So the next country under there is France, 54%. 54% of everything that's made in France is taxed and spent on the state, on state schools, state health services, on housing to support people. And the French live longer than we do. And housing is cheaper in France. And it's of better quality than our housing. And the median French family earns 4,000 more euros a year. We don't ever get to hear this. I want to have sunshine there, but that isn't because of inequality either. Um, I could go down, but you can see there's lots and lots and lots of countries. And then we get down to the relegation part of the table, and that's us. We're 37%. If you remember the last election, that radical Labour manifesto, that was going to move us up to 37 from 36. We play a game in this country of moving a percentage in terms of spending and say it's impossible to do. The point of me showing you this graph is just to point out there are a huge amount of options. In Britain, you're told, oh, to win the global race, we have to behave like this. Please don't look at Europe. Please don't look at any data from Europe. Oh, they're foreigners, so it doesn't apply to us. Greater equality, what is it like? Uh, I often do talks in schools, um, and it's hard in schools because school children don't believe me when I say there was a time when we didn't have homeless people, hardly any of them. And there was a time when you didn't pay £100,000 or £200,000 to get an attachment of a good comprehensive. And they just, they just look at me and go, no, you're, you're on something. Uh, so how do you explain to people who haven't seen greater equality what greater equality is like? You can go to more equal countries. You can go to Scandinavia, you can go to Japan, you can go to practically half of Europe, to be honest. But you actually have to afford to go there. Just look at your family. If you look within a family about how people treat each other within a family, you basically don't set up a mini market system in your family where if you want something for breakfast, you've got to pay somebody else in the family for it. And so on. you're not kind of competing for survival of the fittest. I don't know, you're looking at me a bit strangely, some of you. <laughs> Maybe we do have a kind of new neoliberal family where well, you're going, family, what's that? I've had to leave home since I was 18 and work full-time in London paying the rent. Anyway, let's go off there. Um, I draw lots of maps. I'm only going to show you one later, but <laughs> that map essentially sums it. It was a cartoon done some time ago. Um, when inequality rises more and more and more people become losers. As it becomes steeper, if you're not in the top 10%, and they're not in the top 5%, and they're not at the bottom of the top 1%, you become a loser. And we've got to a point now where bottom of the top 1%, if you want to know, by the way, where that is, uh, who's earning £200,000 a year or more? If you put your hands up. <laughs> Nobody ever has yet. Um, or if <laughs> If you're single, 160,000. 170, 160, 170. We should have at least one couple of people in the 1% here just to be representative. We're in London, which has even more, but nobody from the 1% has turned up. Anyway, that's what you need, 160, 170,000 if you're single to be in the 1%. Uh, probably about 5% of Londoners are there. But on 160, 170,000, do you think you can buy a free bed house in Fulham? No, <laughs> you can't, because they'll give you a mortgage of three and a half times your income. And what about the school fees? And you might look at me and go, well, we don't have to pay school fees. Oh, yes, you do. You're in the 1%. It's not optional. If you're in the 1%, you don't go to the state school. You really don't. If you do, you've got to hide it really, really well. But you wouldn't, because that would be madness. And you don't go to any old private school. You're talking expensive. I'll, I'll go off that. 
before I get further. These kind of pictures, these Welsh parade pictures, you've got to think of different societies having different kind of images of who's down and who's up and who's big and who's small and what kind of income do you need. I'm not going to embarrass you by sorting you out by income. If we had another couple of hours, we'd rearrange this room and the people on the lowest incomes would be on the first and the second there and second there and you'd all try and get out really because it would be painfully nasty if we were to do that. And it'd be painfully nasty because we have an unjustifiable width of income. There's no way you can defend it. The people who would be sitting on the first few rows in this room will probably be doing the most useful jobs. You'll be the child unqualified social worker. You'll be the person making sure that people at the school will get food at lunchtime, which is a really hard job. You've got an hour. Half the food's halal, half isn't. Some are vegetarian. You've got to get it all cooked and served. That's hard. One of you wear at the back will be a human geography professor who has, all he has to do in a day is swan to London, do a talk for an hour, you know, and gets paid too much for it. Because, oh, why do I have to be paid that much? Because I have to have a house. And houses now cost a lot. And why do they cost so much? Because of inequality. Because the people who get paid more have started buying houses at higher prices. And suddenly your human geography professor can justify his income, which actually is completely unjustifiable because he happens to live in the most expensive part of Europe to get a house. And it's the most expensive part of Europe to get a house because it's the most unequal part of Europe. Now, none of you can see that apart from even on the front row, they can't see that. This is the uh, OECD League Table of Inequality for, for OECD countries, okay? And at the top, Mexico is the winner, most unequal, lots of murders. Then Chile. Chile has spent the most on private education in the OECD. Turkey, not doing too well as a country. The United States, bit of a basket case with Trump. Uh, Lithuania, be honest, it's not there now. Lithuania keeps on bobbing up and down annoying the hell out of me. Russia, not a very functional country. And then the United Kingdom. We're there with the basket cases. That's us. Welcome to basket case city. Welcome to basket case country. But when you've got used to being in a basket case, you go, oh, no, no, it's jolly good. We're very multicultural and patriotic, and we've got a good sense of humor, you know, and I don't know. We can, we, can, we can do one hell of a royal wedding, which is true. <laughs> and um, just below us is Israel. So that's where we are. Israel has high income inequalities because there are some issues going on in Israel. This includes the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. But Israel's not as divided. Israel doesn't show as little respect to some people and more to others as we do. But we're used to us. We think, we think we're normal. So bar Lithuania on a bad day, we are the most unequal country by income in Europe, according to the OECD. And I won't, because lack of time to read you all the other countries in the OECD that are normal, that aren't dysfunctional. Mm -hmm. By the way, if you're looking through and trying to come up to reasons for this, Turkey, the former heart of an empire, the Ottoman Empire, Istanbul, is one of the three big cities of Europe. Russia is the heart of a former empire, the USSR, and Moscow is the second of the three big cities of Europe, and London is the third of the former centres of empire in Europe. Um, it's not entirely our fault. There are historical reasons for being a basket case right now, but we have to accept we are. This is an average lowly paid investment banker and 11 care workers, and this is the kind of ratio a few years ago, it's out of date, it's got worse. We have about 2,200 bankers paid over a million euros a year. The next, we only know it because of the European Banking Authority, which is leaving. Um, the next highest is 197 in Germany. When bankers say you have to pay us these wages, otherwise we'll go elsewhere, there is nowhere to go. Nowhere else in Europe pays those salaries. The only place that pays more than London is New York. And the American bankers want to keep their jobs. 
So why are we paying more than 2,000 bankers over a million euros a year? Owen Jones, and I still haven't got the source for the quotes, so I'll say it's Owen Jones, he says it. Owen Jones claims that in the Barclays Bank Tower in Canary Wharf, there are more people paid over a million a year than in the whole of Japan. If you want to see very different societies, compare Japanese society to British society, or an extreme one. Compare the reaction to a disaster like Hurricane Katrina in the United States, when you have National Guard in helicopters with rifles, for those of old enough to remember Katrina, to the tsunami in Japan, and how people reacted to a disaster. In Japan, I was there, I was in Kyoto, and the, st the students I was teaching were collecting skin cream, because everything else had been collected to send to the disaster stone. The equivalent of the Office of National Statistics in Tokyo, when I went there, which is why I was there, beneath me, beneath the tower block, they were dismantling the huge sheds in which they were processing the census forms. And I said, what are you doing? And they said, we're sending them north so people can sleep in them. And I said, that's great. When were you told to do that? And they said, nobody told us. Nobody told us. We just decided immediately to do it. Because, in Japan, they see other Japanese people as human beings. Luckily, we haven't had an environmental disaster in Britain in the last 20 years. The really scary thing to think is how we would behave. We think we'd queue. We think we'd be ever so plucky and British and so on. But when you look at that table, when you look at the other countries at the top of it, it it's worrying to think how we'd behave. What are the causes? I've already given you some ideas about being a former empire, but we managed to become the second most equal country in the 1970s. That's not a great excuse. Some of the causes are people arguing for inequality. There are people who think it's a really good thing. Um, they don't tell you that directly. They don't directly go. Most of you are scum. One or two of you might be useful. We want to pluck the one or two of you out, but we need most of you to keep your, your ideas down to your station, change the sheets of my beds in the hotel, cook my food for me, clean my dishes, be a security guard at the front of my kids' private school, maybe be a teacher. But you can't have kids yourself because, of course, you're living in London. That's what most of you are up to but a couple of you are better. There are people who believe that. Uh, I wrote a book in 2010. I came up with five of these things. So they say elitism is efficient. A few children have to have 35 grand a year spent on them. That's Eton, that's Harrow and so on, because they've got super genes. Because they've got these super clever genes, you've got to spend more on their teachers to make them super brilliant prime ministers, that kind of thing. Exclusion is necessary. The poor will always be with us. Prejudice is natural. David Goodhart's kind of thing about tribes. Uh, greed is good, creates wealth, wealth creators. We need the greedy, they're wonderful. I'm not going to bother defending this. We can do it in questions if you want. Oh, despair is inevitable. There's always going to be mental illness. It's just hard luck. This, is a, this really is just it. And anybody who tells you otherwise is a complete idiot and a fool and should not be a professor at the University of Oxford, which they really love because they spend a lot of money to try and get in to the University of Oxford because they need some kind of self, I don't know, justification for themselves. Uh, our statistics are going to be released tomorrow morning, by the way, the most ex uh, extensive access statistics the University of Oxford released ever on what kind of students come to the University of Oxford. I've got onto the effects. I'm moving forward because I really don't want to keep you too late on a Sunday afternoon. And that is a picture that you will recognise. You don't need to say anything else. It's interesting, isn't it? It's people in my mother's generation will remember Abba Van, which will mean nothing to most of you, but it's the nearest thing to Abba Van. <coughs> when the sludge fell on the primary school in Abba Van, the National Gold Coal Board offered each family £50 for their dead child in the 1960s. Um, this tower, this tower is going to come back again and again and again. That shot's taken in the documentary where they've lined it up 
with some of the eight million pound houses uh, which you've got in the foreground. Why am I showing you this? Because I'm gonna spend five minutes telling you about health effects of inequality. <coughs> Everything goes wrong when you let the greedy take more. Everything goes wrong. Your housing system goes wrong, the price of your housing, putting cladding for the benefit of the rich, that kind of idiocy only occurs with extreme inequality. Your prisons become full. You have the highest imprisonment rate on your continent when you have high inequality and your hospitals don't work. This chart here was released by ONS in autumn of last year. And what it's showing is that in 2000, sorry, 1990, the UK ranked seventh by neonatal mortality. Only six countries in Europe was a newborn baby better off. We were doing pretty well, we were seventh. By 2015, we got down to 19th on neonatal mortality. We've gone past Portugal, loads of, when I was born, if I'd been born in Portugal, I'd be three times more likely to die in the first year of my life. Portugal was the terrible example in Europe in the, in the late 1960s. We're down to 19th for neonatal mortality. We are heading to Romania. I mean, this is kind of good news for Romania. This isn't, by the way, because Romanians are coming here. It's, it's not poor immigrants having babies that die. A third of midwives in the middle of London are EU citizens, but not UK citizens. How you think you're going to have your babies? I don't know, after March 29th. Anyway, down to 19th for neonatal mortality. That's 2015. In the two years after that, infant mortality as a whole rose and rose again. This is the first rise two years in a row since the Second World War. And the reports of it, almost nothing. Almost nothing. Infant mortality goes down. It doesn't go up, but it goes up here. Where else does it go up? The United States, in particular Texas. We are the Texas of Europe. Has Jeremy Hunt answered a single question about the rise in infant mortality? A significant, a statistically significant rise, if you're going to be asked about that kind of thing. But it is. Not a word. Not a word. It's dead babies is the most shameful, shameful thing. This graph comes from the British Medical Journal. It's the first 16 weeks of this year. 20,000 more people have died and have died in the same weeks of the last five years. The last five years have been utterly appalling and awful. But somehow, on top of all of that, we are still managing to increase the mortality rate, mainly of the elderly. And this includes the period where we cancelled all operations for weeks in the NHS so that people wouldn't die. So God knows what would have happened if we hadn't done that. Uh, it is truly staggering. Life expectancy is now plateauing. It's only kept flat by healthy young Europeans coming to this country with their healthy young bodies and not dying. Once net migration begins to fall, <coughs> once the young, fit, well-qualified people from France and Spain and Hungary and Germany come in fewer numbers, which is already beginning, and once we can't export our elderly to the coast of Spain and to Crete and so on at the rate we've been doing, we're in much deeper trouble. We had a really unfair deal with Europe. Uh, we weren't paying our fair share. Margaret Thatcher did an opt-out, so we weren't actually paying what we should have paid in. But much more importantly, and much more expensively for the mainland, we were taking the most enthusiastic, best qualified, fittest young people from the mainland paying them peanuts to do our basic service jobs and exporting our elderly to die there. David Cameron's dad died in France. Nick Clegg's dad died in France. It was unbelievably unfair. Um, really, really not decent behaviour to do. Last graph on infant mortality. Along the bottom, you've got the take of the 1%. Way back in 1983, this comes from a little book called Do We Need Economic Inequality? And on the side, you've got infant mortality. It, it looks very strong because all the states of the United States are included. Because to, to get real extreme examples of what real inequality is, you need to have Mississippi and Louisiana and Alabama up there. 
That's the kind of way we're going towards. That's, that's, kind of, that's winning the global race, as George Osborne used to call it. And then at the other end, you've got Finland, Norway, Sweden, <laughs> Portugal. It's unbelievable, isn't it? Portugal, run by dictators with the worst record in the 1970s, 1960s, now at the bottom. Japan, Italy, the Netherlands, and so on. Poverty is when you can't save, when you can't save £10 a month. If you want a kind of definition of what it means to be at the very bottom, it's the absolute inability to plan. Half of all children in Britain now have no holiday a year. That is going away, not staying with a relative. So they come back at the end of the summer holidays and they lie. Or actually, they stop lying. We've just been looking at the statistics the uh, last couple of days. We think they stopped lying because the idea that you should be able to have a summer holiday is beginning to disappear. So you don't have to pretend you went on one anymore because almost everybody you know doesn't go on one. Meanwhile, people in the top 10%, how many holidays? Skiing, holiday at Easter, it's Easter, it's tiring work, you need to get away at Easter. Camping in the summer and then off to the med. That's the kind of difference we have. But we need our holidays because it's really tiring. It's hard, it's stressful, isn't it? Being in the top 10%. So what does it feel like being in the bottom 50% and having no holidays anymore? So another graph from another government report. I'm doing nothing clever here. I'm not getting, I used to, when I was young, I used to have to go and get data and I used to have to analyse it. It was really hard to find bad news. I, mean, I, I was trying to find bad news. I criticised the Labour government. I found relative things not improving and so on. I don't have to do any of that anymore. I, don't, I just go and pick a graph out of a government report. I don't have to worry about the subtleties of the North-South divide. It's absolutely rising. I used to have to work out whether relative poverty was... Now we've got food banks. You know, This one... This comes from what was the Social Mobility and Child Poverty Commission before all the commissioners resigned en masse and discussed last year. And it's showing you the proportion of families with children in England in private renting. Heading up, it's now over 25%, quarter. Quarter of families with kids have got a private landlord. Just look how fast it went up. You know, how quick does it take to get back to the 1930s when most people had a private landlord? It wasn't the plan. There really wasn't a set of neoliberals sitting there going, let's make those families with kids into private renting. They wanted everybody else first. Because the problem with kids in private renting is that they tend to be evicted every three years by the landlord. And then you lose all your friends again and again and again, and you have to move school, and you don't win the global race. Um, so part of what's going on at the moment is a kind of disaster. I said I was going to try and make it lighthearted, so I will calm down, but you can see how you get angry with this kind of thing. Trickle down, I guess at least trickle down is disappearing as an idea. The idea, we used to be told it would trickle down. You don't really need to be shown this. This, this is data, the commiserations for being in London, but the ways. So data showing your chances of escaping private renting are, dis, are going down as you get older. So you'll, you'll be paying all your life to a private landlord so they can have the six holidays a year, or 10. Um, well, I've done it another way. The political co consequences, the country splits, areas which are Tory become more Tory, areas which are Labour become more Labour. That little graph is showing the segregation index, and the thing at the end is interesting, but I'm going to zoom faster. Okay, optimism. You can only do it for so long. You can only take the piss for so long. You can take the piss. You can do it throughout the 80s. You can talk about the economy as like my purse in my handbag, and you can win that. You could do it in the 90s, saying, don't worry, dot com will save us. All things can only get better. Look at that shiny, nice Mr. Blair. You can do it through the 2000s. Look at my amazing Shore Start centres. Aren't they lovely? But you get into a point where you can't do it anymore because things are getting absolutely worse for most people. And what happens then, because it eventually cracks, 
What I'm saying is that the weird bloke with the beard who's forced to stand because none of his mates will stand gets enough nominations at 10 seconds to midnight, stands in an election for a political party he doesn't want to win, becomes leader, is forced to do a second leadership contest because he's not allowed to be leader, wins that despite the fact you've got to pay £25 to vote, faces numerous coups, still doesn't want to be prime minister, learns after 180 public rallies finally how to do a speech, can't lead anything, goes into an election when the Prime Minister is told she has to call it because nobody has ever lost an election from this position in the history of British politics and she must call it. And then in May and June of last year gets the biggest, fastest, largest swing that we have ever seen in this country. It's shown here as being equivalent to 1945, but it isn't because the 1945 swing occurred over 10 years. 1935 to 45, and the war, and a huge amount of bloodshed. And this swing occurred over just two years, and it's at 9.6. Miliband, bless him, if you like, Ed, he got a tiny 1.4% swing, you know, with that, I may be laughing, but that's good compared to what Brown got, which is negative, or what Blair got twice, which is negative. The only one Blair did any well on is 1997, and that had nothing to do with Blair. That was about 18 years of conservative rule. That was why. So things are beginning to change. My friend Ella has drawn lots of cartoons for me because she says my voice droning on really doesn't work and the graphs are horrible and it's just me that likes the graphs. Well, I know it's true. So that cartoons are better. We are living in that kind of society with a bent ladder. Everybody's scared. Right at the top, I know people at the very top. They're scared. I can talk to you about it. It's very hard to get sympathy for people at the top. But the interesting thing, and it's really good that they're scared, because don't believe that they're sitting around their swimming pools absolutely happy, drinking, you know, martinis with the happy little family. That's not the life of people at the top. And that's great. Because if it was, it'd be harder. But it isn't the life. Everybody's scared, and they're scared of falling down at the top. That's why the private school is absolutely obligatory. Because you can't imagine falling. I'll give you an example. The gap between most of you and somebody in the top point half a percent of society is the same as the gap between most of you and the people who will be in the park this evening who clearly aren't going to get a hostel place. And their gap in terms of thinking is the same. In that your lives my life, one house, one home, one car, no savings of any substance, no guaranteed future for children, all have to get jobs. My life is there something to be as frightened of as I would be frightened of me or my kids being on the street. That's why people at the very top are frightened, because your life is unimaginable. How do you pay rent? How do you make sure you get a job all the time? How do you budget? How do you do those things? How do you go to one of those schools that you don't pay? Aren't they full of drugs and fights and whatever? The truth, of course, is that drugs in schools are directly proportional to the income of parents. If you want your kids not to get drugs, don't send them to a private school. Um, it's easy to see why. The children who go to private schools can take 20 or 40 pounds out of the wallet and the parents don't know. Anyway. Good news. Since 1990, the gap in the bottom 90% has been falling. For the last five years, the take of the 1% has been falling, but the take of the point ones has been going up. There was a year last year where the rise of the super rich 1,000 was actually less than the fall in the pound. So although the Sunday Times rich list got richer, they actually got poorer in international currency, which is one that they work in. The High Pay Centre last year reported that the pay of CEOs in Britain, the chief executive officers, had fallen by almost a million pounds each on average. And hardly anybody covered it, apart from to say they still pay too much. That's brilliant. But it was the first time in my life that the CEO's pay had actually fallen. 
And finally, the cherry on the cake a few weeks ago, the highest paid man in Britain leaves his post. Let's put it like that because he can afford very expensive lawyers. Martin Sorrell, not a very happy man if you were to look at Martin. I think uh, that's the effect of spending your days in private jets going around the world. There's been research actually on the effects on your skin and body on flying around in private jets in the world. But there's Martin, the highest paid person that's ever been in this country, probably the highest paid person I think in Europe. No longer in a job. Nobody's going to be paid that much again. It's already happened with the head of the BBC, it's already happened at the head of Barclays, it's already happened enormously. We've come to the end. It's slightly premature to say it, but this is what it felt the last time we came to the end. And it didn't feel great. It didn't feel great for two, three decades. Because the problem about peak inequality is that you're still up there at the top. Even as you begin to go down, it's tricky. We have lots of people campaigning. You need them campaigning. You need to be angry. You can't be complacent. You need to have good schools. Children deserve good schools. After Chile, we're the OECD country that spends the second highest on private schools. Half of all children in Kensington do not go to a state school. Half the adults do not use state health care. promised you one more map. Uh, this is London with sea level rise. It's a bit esoteric, but there's a really, really interesting connection between inequality and carbon footprint. And the higher the economic inequality in your country, the bigger the overall carbon footprint, of which, of course, the highest is the 1% jetting everywhere. But everybody else's is, is pushed up. Now, you may not believe in climate change, but if you believe in climate change, you can't have high economic inequality. Um, it won't be as dramatic as this. There are different shades. Don't worry, you're not going to lose it all. Um, but there is a reason why they built the Thames Barrier. And there's also a reason why we're building flood relief channels around Oxford and Reading to send the water even faster down the Thames so we don't flood because we're selfish because the old idea of letting the water spread out has gone. So if you want to get that kind of disaster, the kind of selfish country is what you head towards. We have different kinds of soup kitchens today. We have food banks. It's not the same kind of poverty. 1905, one in four infants died before their first birthday, the worst year ever in British history. Now, even though I say it's rising, you're talking three, four per thousand. But that still means getting quite close to Romania. Okay, things are different. It's not the same kind. The mental health is worse. The mental health, the anxiety and depression is actually worse than the past. The physical health is better. You've got central heating, you're not happy in your head. Which would you prefer? My last slide, you'll be very glad to know. So let me indulge me in just reading it because I honestly think this is true. I'm really interested in what you've got to say. I often worry people say, oh, you're fanciful, Danny, it can't happen. But the point is, whenever things have happened, we've adapted to them so quickly that we forget they happened. And that makes us think that things can't happen. So what I say here at the end is that when change truly happens, at first it strikes seasoned commentators as frankly being impossible. It's a pipe dream. Then it's undesirable. It's full of negative consequences. You can't do that. Then it becomes just about possible. And once the clamor for change becomes overwhelming, finally the change happens. And then the memories of the commentators changes with it. They will say that they believed in the change as desirable all along. They somehow saw it coming too. You, you may say how many people saw the crash of 2008 coming. And they were on the right side of history. Everybody tries to be on the right side of history, hugging huskies and always having a friend who's not as white as they are. And then, we can all forget that just a few years ago, those same people are so vehemently opposed to change, they justified the status quo, they were scornful, and they were ultimately wrong. But that doesn't matter, because that's just history. What matters is ensuring that we are now at the peak and we're starting on the way down, and knowing it's a long way to go. Thank you for your patience on such a hot night. Please think of a few questions for me. Thank you. <laughs>
invest, the investment the started at Google was minimal. And um, it has, it's yeah. one of the biggest. So the question, because this is the 100 highest paid CEOs. So is the fact that Google and Facebook are doing so well mean that these other companies can't actually make enough money to pay their COEs, uh, CEOs as much? Um, they're still doing remarkably well, the other companies. So they're making billions. The CEOs are paid, on average, I think it's about five million. So you could still pay a CEO another million or another two million. It's their remuneration committees have finally decided to, might be temporarily, but for the first time they've, they've done it. The firms have enough money. Um, the one interesting thing going back to last peak, going back to 1913, is that almost none of the companies that were in the top 100 then exist now. Um, so these revolutions happen and, and things change. Mainland Europe is trying to control Facebook and Google. More unequal countries um, like us don't. More unequal countries than us like the United States foster and harbour them. More equal countries like China absolutely ban them. They're not there. Um, so, in your book, are you providing any solutions? Do you think that uh, we have, we can overcome this or we can avoid this downfall? Mm -hmm. um, I have a go, try. I mean, I do think it is mainly political. I, I, there are other things you can do personally, which is talking to people about it. Uh, John Maynard Keynes was involved last time, and he created some theory that uh, hardly anybody could understand called the general theory of whatever. He had a friend who was a banker called Oswald Foulkes. And Oswald Foulkes said to him, what you've actually achieved is to help change the moral sentiment. And the moral sentiment in the 1930s changed what was seen as acceptable. And that's also changed here. If you can remember 2005 and 6, the news would report about once every three months some bankers coming out of Canary Wharf buying a bottle of champagne for £30,000 with a diamond worth 10,000 in it, but the other 20 was just gone. And there they were drinking it, and we were celebrating their success. That's all gone. So changing the moral sentiment by not being impressed by celebrity and money is, is a personal thing people can do. And there's a huge set of things then in between that and electing a government actually committed to greater equality who have the power to do things like bringing back rent control uh, to stop landlords simply just buying all the property up. There's an enormous amount that is done already, can be done. Wherever you work, if you work, you can ask why are the cleaners not getting a living wage if they're not getting it? And you can also ask, does the boss really need more? Um, I mean, that's other things, gender pay gaps uh, were released, data was released for the first time this April. And that shows, it's all predictable, all the inequality is in the best off quarter of every firm, and it's the men getting more. The gender pay gap release is brilliant, because any man in the top quartile of any organisation which has had their data released basically can't ask for a pay rise this year, because next year um, it's got to get better. So there are lots of things happening already. This government under George Osborne has actually put more taxes on landlords. Uh, and they could do it because <laughs> there's nowhere to the right to stop them. So there's a whole set of things being done. There's a whole lot of things you can do. I, what I think is unlikely, um, and normally if I talk in London as somebody who says, but what about revolution, basically? I think an extremely fast move towards equality is unlikely because the only times that happens is tends to be absolute disasters. Uh, and then the end results are not bad. Uh, Japan has the highest life expectancy in the world because of an absolute disaster in 1946. Germany is a very equitable country because of an absolute disaster in 1945. Um, but it's very hard to engineer absolute disasters and they are quite painful to go through. What about inheritance? Do you, do you believe in inheritance tax? Because I believe that, that to, uh, for, to reduce this gap, if you do pose inheritance tax more, then that is one of the easiest ways of uh, overcoming uh, this inequality gap. 
Yeah, I sp I've only talked about income and talked for sort of long enough. Um, and, and I'm, you get income inequality down, uh, wealth inequality lags by 10 or 20 years. Uh, but there are many other ways. Um, I'm not too worried about inheritance tax because it's too easy to dodge. So the kind of things I'm interested in are having a Chancellor's Exchequer who wants house prices to fall by 1% every year to get to German levels. That gets rid of the wealth that could be inherited and annual wealth taxes. Um, they're, they're more effective than inheritance tax. The other thing, which we may appear to have gone away forever, but certainly helped in the 1970s, was inflation. Inflation absolutely ate away at the wealth of the rich and got rid of what they had uh, to inherit. So we got to a point in the 70s where you couldn't sell a stately home because it wasn't worth anything because nobody wanted to buy it. Um, and that was quite, that was quite extreme. But that necessarily is not good for the economy either, yeah. right? It's the economy was great in the 70s. We had full employment. You could just walk out of a job and get another one. It was absolutely brilliant. <laughs> yeah, it was uh, unbelievable. Um, beyond the sense of shouting for it or just the sheer glee that comes with the rich being scared, um, what, 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 are the, what sort of political consequences do you imagine that might have? Why is it a good thing? <coughs> well, it's partly good and partly bad. The, the bad side of the rich being scared is they really work hard um, to stop anything happening. Sunday Times Rich List has a table of the top 50 donors. And it's quite staggering this time, because this time it starts with Lord Bamford, who gave 2.7 million, I think, in one year. And it goes down, Conservative, 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 SNP, one. Conservative, 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 UKIP, one. All Conservative until number 50, which was Lord MacAlpine, who'd had a bad year and only gave them 70,000. And that's fear. Uh, that's, they're not just one, they've already lords, so you don't need another knighthood or anything. Um, the fear. The, the, the potential good side of it, and you see it with the third generation, so Abbeydale G Disney. Um, the third or fourth generation of the rich who inherit, tend the, the, the selfish gene seems to have gone away. The thing that originally made the man rich, it's almost always the man, rich and nasty. And the third or fourth generation do things like write to the mayor of New York saying, please tax us more. We want to be part of society. Um, so it does go. It, it's when you're, I wouldn't be gleeful. I, I honestly, I'm well off enough, okay? And I've got a home, it's fine. I wouldn't want to. Um, but part of the reason why I wouldn't want two homes is that I know people who've got two homes. Um, can you imagine sorting out the bills for two homes and things? And then you can, but don't worry, you, if you get three or four homes, you can get a household manager who will do that for you. But then imagine worrying about your, whether your household manager is scamming you. Um, and then, well, they do, you get paranoid. Your accountant might be ripping you off. Poor things, what? <laughs> they, imagine having a relationship with your children, which is never truthful, where your children can never tell you what they really think, but have to lie to you their whole lives because they must never get on the wrong side of you because they need inheritance. Now, that, I won't, I won't try too hard to do sympathy for the rich. Um, I wrote something about the royal family, um, who bless are very useful for tourism. Um, but the younger royals are born into a form of slavery. They've got to spend their whole lives smiling and waving. They've got no choice. Um, we still no sympathy for them. I'm going to have to work at it. I'll give you a last, a last one. Uh, I once got taken into a house in Mayfair with a camera crew with Robert Peston. And the house was on the market for 25 million. It was a free bed. 25 million. And it had two basements that they cut out. And in the very bottom basement of this basically bog standard semi, they'd cut a swimming pool out, full size swimming pool. And I just saw standing next to the swimming pool and the people were filming. And I went, even if this house was painted with a thin layer of gold, the gold wouldn't be worth 25 million. 
and this is the worst death trap you could possibly put in a house. This is what, you know, a swimming pool is what you drown in, at which point the estate agent <laughs> said, get out. But, you know, actually living in a house with a swimming pool in the basement, you know, I'll stop trying to defend, but you don't... Okay. <laughs> oh, <coughs> think about the amount of cocaine you have to consume if you're that rich. <laughs> Um, you described um, that uh, inequality seems sort of uh, there's sort of some sort of pushback. Yes. Um, I'm just wondering whether you think Brexit, whatever shape or form that takes, whether that's going to speed up that process, or essentially are we sort of moving more mid Atlantic, moving the economy more and more like the US? Brexit makes things much more interesting. So there's two Brexit options really. I don't think the middle one's likely. So they're too extreme. One is Empire 2.0 what Jacob Rees-Mogg wants, a new Singapore. And that is avowedly a much more unequal UK. Uh, richer, he'll claim, but much more unequal. More servants, more hedge fund managers. Um, and zooming up to the very top of the OECD table. Okay, and that's the name. That's, that's what the men who pay. That's why the Taxpayers' Alliance were involved. You know, the chief executive of Brexit campaign was Matthew Elliott who was the chief executive of the Taxpayers' Alliance. This is why Dominic Cummings was there. I don't think they're going to get that, but that's why they bothered. That's why the, the £16 million came into the campaign. The other thing, which is much more likely, is that Brexit accelerates greater equality. We're lucky. And the way it does that is London house prices in the middle are already 10% down. We know they're going down more. Why buy now? when you've got Brexit uncertainty going on. You already know that the younger Canary Wharf bankers and lawyers, sorry for people who just bought, um, well, not that sorry, it's the same. <laughs> anyway, you know that the younger lawyers and bankers have already been sent to Frankfurt and Amsterdam quietly, the ones without family. Um, we know that the bankers' pay has stopped rising because you can't claim that you have to pay them this much if they'll, or they'll leave if you're actually trying to get them to leave, because you need them to be in Paris. We have no passporting agreement for our banks, and this is the height of our inequality is, is the banks. Um, the most affected cities are not places like Middlesbrough or Stoke or Wales, with its EU funding. It's London, or a better example is Oxford. Uh, we have the BMW plant, which produces 1% of the entire manufacturing output of the country in my city, employs 3,000 people, half of which are Eastern European men. It has 1,200 robots that make the cars. Each one of those fits in the back of an articulated lorry and there's a plant on the Austrian border it can go to. If there is not seamless trade across the channel, that and much else simply goes. That's, it's all ready to go, it's just waiting to see uh, what happens. But most importantly, we have a Tory party fighting itself tooth and nail. And the Tory party has been the defender of inequality, always. Margaret Thatcher talked about the need for tall poppies to grow. You know, she was more... You know, a Tory party uh, that has got itself into a kind of fight to the death over this thing. And its eye is off the ball over defending inequality. Its eyes on the ball of sovereignty, discovering that there's a border in Ireland and it might matter. Boris's ego, the fantasies of a few other weird men, you know, Theresa May trying to stagger on for her various illnesses. You know, it's a kind of tragic farce going on. And the group whose main job is to defend inequality and claim it's okay um, are about to own Brexit. It's theirs. They called a the referendum. This thing is theirs, the repercussions are theirs. What happens to middle of London when all the people who serve food and keep the buses going and everything else quietly go because the pounds dropped? And you feel really, really, really unwelcome? I mean, why, why would you? I've written three books since I've been in Oxford with co-authors. They've all left. They were all from the mainland. They've all gone. Because if you were any good, why would you stay? If you can leave, why would you stay when clearly immigration was the major issue and people don't want you here? And then how do you keep things running? How do you keep the computers running? 
How do you keep the telephones working where you work? How do you do the basic things? We'll still get bosses, that's easy. You just send them to a posh school, they learn how to lead and so on. But we don't teach people how to actually do stuff. Um, the, but the plus side of this is it's much, much, much better than the war. You know, if you wanted to engineer a mini disaster <coughs> likely to accelerate equality getting greater because the rich have most to lose and the poor have nothing to lose, what do you have to lose if you're going to a soup kitchen? Uh, this is the way you do it. And if, if you want to begin to alter the British class system, which is part of our problem, destroying the credibility of the party which you know, most supports the class system, yeah, this is this is it, uh, and I, I, you know, probably you know you always end up muddling through, but I don't see a muddle through option there. I think it's either Empire 2.0 or like the Suez Crisis, but a hundred times bigger. National embarrassment, shameful, big kind of mistake. I'm partly very grateful that it was 52:48. I worry if it had been 55% remain, 45% leave it would have carried on slowly, slowly for another 10, 15 years. Um, whereas what we've got is a fast, hard bang. Um, <coughs> a kind of okay then, let's see if all our problems were caused by immigrants. You know, we're about to find out. Um, the problem is I'm human and old enough to worry about people suffering in the very short term about it. But it isn't our fault. It's David Cameron's fault and it's the Conservative Party's fault for being torn apart, which is why he had to call that referendum. And it's the fault of the people who paid money to get the UKIP vote up, because there's no <coughs> organic rise in the UKIP vote. I can show you a graph showing the UKIP vote being stirred up before each European election. And it was stirred up by businessmen, James Goldsmith was the first, who want independence for the UK because they don't want their tax affairs investigated by a European body. Um, essentially, they want to keep their money, and the best way to keep their money is to keep a sovereign separate island that they, they own. The mainland of Europe isn't going to put up with this. Um, as I said at the beginning about numeracy, every single other country in Europe, almost every single other country in Europe, people are more numerate. Are they going to let us sit there taking the, the mickey, still using our bank accounts and letting us slice them off as the money leaves their jurisdiction and goes back again. Um, they're just, they're going to politely, very kindly, just quietly say no. The only other part of Europe which is left is Greenland. Greenland had 56,000 people. It took three years, not two, to negotiate. And crucially, Greenland had fish. So there's something worth negotiating over. And I'm not being that ironic, but other than Meghan Merkel and tourism, which is good, and we're going to need more of it, you know, what have we actually got? Um, one of the changes over the past 40 years, which I think has something to do with the growth in inequality, is the decline of the power of organised labour to bargain away traditional power for the wages. In 79, almost 60 percent of UK workers would get more than seven a day. On a very good day, it's something like 20 percent. There's lots of reasons for that, which I don't want to go into. Do you see the revival of the power of the United States as one strand of the solution? Um, it'll be good as one strand. Um, it's amazing how threatening to take away pensions in universities gets people to join the union again. <laughs> no, but it, but it does. It, but it's only one strand. One of our big problems is, is that a lot of our only hopes are going back to the past. Um, so we talk about wanting council houses like we had in the 70s and comprehensives like we had in the 70s, uh, and health service like we had, had organised like we had in the 70s. And what we need and what we're not doing, I'm not doing, is looking at new ways of doing things. And the problem is because most people are not in big units like mines or factories or universities for that matter. Um, the traditional way of a union won't work as well. You need, you need, or unions need to adapt. So your union is something that isn't just organised at your workplace, uh, but something you belong to. It could be a neighbourhood, I don't know. Um, 
but we need different things. What exactly is the role of being a former empire in the course of inequality here and in Russia and Turkey? Okay, well, yeah, how, how can being a former empire? Uh, it's only three cases, but it's trying to work out, you know, why us? We know we're not innately stupid. How did we get fooled? Um, well, I'll tell you our story. I won't try their story. So our story is that 1820s, we begin to go around the world. We disrupt the social systems of huge numbers of places that aren't even countries. We cause a worldwide population boom from one billion to seven. That was us, um, you know, by, by what we did to the world. And we take over large parts of it, and the money comes rolling in. Um, so the university I work in is an empire university. Most of the buildings were built during the empire. London is it's an empire city. Um, Charles Darwin comes along and publishes a book called The Origin of Species, tells you that God doesn't exist, uh, but survival of the fittest is there, and as somebody's at the top. And he publishes it just at the time when, well, we're at the top. And so people at the top in England begin to think that they are special. William Beveridge called it the British race, so that everybody should have four babies for the good of the race. And we had the belief uh, Kipling had it, and so on, that, that we were a kind of master race. How, how else can you take over Afghanistan with 12 men with rifles on, you know, a pass? And that's the kind of mindset you have to have to run an empire. You have to believe you're superhuman. And you have to believe that you're almost ordained by God to do it, and it's a white man's bird, and all kinds of lies you have to tell yourself um, to, to do this. And it's the same for the Roman Empire and so on. So... That's your backdrop uh, until the First World War. And then you begin to lose parts of it. And then bits begin to rebel. And then they go. And then you desperately, desperately, after the Second World War, say, please, can we call it a Commonwealth? And please, will you take the Queen as head of it? But we promise not to insist that her child becomes the next one. Um, and then you lose India and you lose various parts of Africa in the 60s, and the last ones go in the 70s. And then you have an economic crisis that you blame on oil. Oil had a little bit to do with it, but you were getting tribute. We were getting money by owning an empire. In New Zealand, if you go and try and buy linen, it's called Manchester. On the corridors, it's called Manchester. We had fixed trade that we'd arranged at the barrel of a machine gun. And when the last colony went, we became dramatically poorer. But because we had told ourselves that this was the white man's burden and we were running this empire for the good of the rest of the world and we made nothing out of it, we looked at the 1970s at the end and went, oh, it must be the trade unions. It must be those immigrants that have come over from the Caribbean. It must be whatever. You lose an empire, you're going to become rapidly poorer. When I was probably your age, maybe not, you get 10 francs to the pound. You go off to France, France and get 10 francs, like 10 euros for the pound. Um, if you want to wonder why elder people voted to leave, they've been taught at school in their school textbooks about their natural superiority. The first professor of geography at Oxford talked about the white race's superiority. And they also knew they were richer in the world. And they've got to a point now where their grandchildren can't possibly get the kind of house that they've got there's precarity, everything's bad, and they vote for an alternative. So, and that only happens in somewhere that's the heart of an empire. Um, it's, a, it's a kind of excuse. The question is, how long does it take to learn? The only example I think we've got in Europe is the Netherlands. They were the richest country before us, and that was a hell of a long time ago. House prices, when they peaked in Amsterdam, fell for 250 years in real terms. Just leave that with you. Uh, 250 years, and before then you got to go to Venice and so on. So, so we, it doesn't work for my, my statisticians want for, for decent sample size. You know, we don't have enough former empires to truly judge. Um, but if you're trying to let the Conservative Party off slightly, their great-grandparents and great-great-grandparents were the rulers of the planet. And they're the kind of descendants of this and they can barely keep themselves together as it is, and they feel obliged to do that. And the last thing to say over where we are, how weird it is, 
our Conservative Party a few years ago, I think it's 2009, left the normal block of European Conservatives and joined the Polish Law and Justice Party and Alternative for Deutschland and became a far-right political party. And we didn't even notice that they were no longer Conservatives. And I'm hoping that's the last gasp and the kind of death throes of empire. I think, yeah, get through this one and finally we can begin to become a normal European country where almost all children go to a state school because that's what happens everywhere else in Europe, where you don't make money just by buying a house because you don't have speculation and where you care for other people and you think they're like you, not some kind of lower order that's not quite the same species as your superhuman species that wants to take over the planet. That, that's my way I tell it to myself of how we are and how we got to get out of this. Thank you ever so much for letting me waffle on.